So I think I ought to get this out of my system and preface this whole topic by saying that I think PC gaming is pretty great right now. And you won't often hear me argue for the preservation of the status quo on pretty much any other topic, but when it comes to the healthiness and the accessibility of the PC as a gaming platform in this present moment of time, I think we got it pretty swell. I haven't upgraded my hardware in three years. All the games I throw at it just work, and they're dirt cheap. I remember that it was around Christmas of 2008 when the first big Steam sale happened, and once I saw Unreal Tournament 3 go on sale for $5, that's about when I started to notice a glorious mane of golden hair flowing in the wind behind me. The pricey overhead of the PC itself is steep compared to consoles, but it's kinda like making an investment. Once you factor in $5 games and totally free services, it really starts to show itself as a cheaper alternative over a longer period of time. And if we're dealing with the longer console cycle than usual, then that means you get to spend less money on hardware upgrades to keep up. And that is a good thing. PC gaming is pretty good these days. I mean, sure, the publishers are more evil than they used to be, and all the good PC IPs are turning into watered-down, simplified mush, but god, I remember just 10 years ago having to install 5 discs of Counter-Strike before I had a DVD drive. And even that was better than all the bullshit you had to put up in the 90s with these proprietary game networks and the complicated sound card setups. And I, I guess I'm just trying to prove a point here. And that is that right now, there's a careful balance of power in place that's making PC gaming way more enjoyable than it's ever been before. For starters, just look at all these games. I don't have time to play all the games I own, and I got most of them for under $10. How does that even make sense? It's like we're in some kind of golden age. But as a good game of Civilization will show you, all golden ages must come to an end eventually. So with the coming of a new generation of consoles comes a new lineup of Steam products. But they might actually have more to do with the future of Windows than the future of consoles. Now, all of these announcements didn't exactly jump out of the bushes and surprise everyone. Last year, we had Big Picture Mode shortly before the Linux release of Steam, and news of an upcoming Steam box began circulating as early as March of 2012. But now the official announcements have finally been made, and it's still kind of a confusing concept. And that's because these Steam machines aren't really a true competitor to Windows or to consoles. At least, right now they aren't, and they probably won't break into those large mainstream markets for a few years. They're kind of a contingency plan more than anything else. Of course, right now Valve is fairly successful, so it would be nice if the world just stopped right here because this is a point in time when we're doing well, but the process is actually going to continue to go on. The reason why Valve is pouring so much money into Linux now is because they fear future incompatibility with Windows. With Windows 8, we saw the introduction of a built-in app store that sells games, which is, understandably, the kind of territory that both companies would want to fight over. Microsoft already has a platform they want you to play games on, that's the Xbox. They get a cut from every game sold there and not on the games sold through Steam, which is running on their operating system. And it might be worth saying that Microsoft is pushing towards tablets and phones rather than tower computers. So Steam's home turf, which is on those tower computers running older versions of Windows, is shrinking because desktop PCs are becoming irrelevant. And the reason why is because Microsoft is making them irrelevant. But Steam doesn't need to adopt to Microsoft's handheld future because despite the decline of PC sales, PC game sales have skyrocketed. So in spite of seeing year-over-year -year unit declines in PC sales on the gaming side, we're seeing huge increases. So we're going up 76% year over year. At the same time, PC unit sales are getting double digit declines. So should Microsoft continue to go the way they've been going, they want to have an alternative to Windows PCs. And Linux PCs are their choice. But right now, there are so many roadblocks. Linux has a market share of like 2%, and about 6% of Steam's total library is currently supported. Those aren't good numbers, but the sales pitch is that almost every game out there has a lot of performance improvements to be gained in Linux. Specifically, Steam's Linux, stuff that can't be done in Windows thanks to a smaller OS footprint and gaming-specific optimizations made on lower levels. In fact, on that same day, AMD revealed a low-level graphics API of their own, and uh, wait, let me explain. Okay, so when you make a game for Windows or for Xbox, there's this thing called DirectX that's an application programming interface. Basically, the set of commands, functions, and tools 
tools that make graphics show up on the screen. You don't have to use that one, there are options like AMD's upcoming Mantle or OpenGL, which is also on the PS3 and Linux, and besides being open source it's almost the same thing as DirectX. But since DirectX is proprietary to Microsoft, you don't see it on Linux, and hold on, let me, let me simplify. Basically, the actual process of porting a game from Windows to Linux should be fairly doable if someone's still around to do it. If the developer has enough incentive to, or if modders have the capability to, you'll probably see all the important Steam games get Linux versions eventually. But legacy support is where that porting process gets so much more uncertain. Ideally, you don't want to have to rely on Wine. That lack of a games library, which would come both from the necessity of a porting process and from Linux's small user base, is probably going to be Steam's biggest problem. The technical hurdles actually aren't that high, but the economic hurdles are enormous. You know, installing a whole new operating system and setting up a dual boot is work, and people are going to need incentives to do that. And the casual consumers out there probably won't even know how to do that. For Valve's best customers, there's a lot more value to be gleaned, and already spent, on a backlog of unplayed games, rather than new releases. And for a long time, Linux simply isn't going to be able to support all those products. A straight-up switch to SteamOS would suddenly mean that you can't play 90% of your purchased games. But that's where the in-house streaming comes in. The idea is that you run Steam on your big fancy and probably Windows-based gaming computer and stream the game out to another machine, like a cheap little living room computer. On the Steam Machines page, you can see that this is the feature they're betting on for that legacy support. And the idea of relying on a streaming service for older games sounds kind of familiar. You know, as great as PC gaming is right now, streaming kinda sucks right now. Both OnLive and Gaikai, before Sony scooped it up, had serious problems with video compression and input lag. But there's no telling how much better or worse the experience is going to be when streaming this stuff locally through your own network on your own machines. And I don't really think there are any PC services like that right now. You can remotely play with the PS Vita or Wii U gamepad, but to the best of my knowledge I have no idea how this would work across a hardwired Cat5 connection instead of wireless. There should still be some lag coming from video processing, but since there's no precedent, I guess we just gotta wait and see. But that streaming feature is where I feel most of the value of the SteamOS lies in. I have a living room computer that I'm kinda satisfied with. It's perfect for emulators and 2D games, but just doesn't have the horsepower to play AAAs. And if I could get those $5 AAA ports out there and play them with an Xbox controller, then that would be great. But that's a really specific purpose for a whole new operating system. And really, the only trouble it saves me from is having to haul the desktop computer out into the living room. And there's also this controller. I said Xbox controller just then because I can't really picture this thing replacing it, or keyboards and mice, even for the living room. What you do is you rub your thumbs across these concave trackpads to simulate mouse or stick movements, and that's an idea that I think might work? On a touchscreen surface that's simulating a joystick, you have no sensory reference on the surface for where the neutral position is supposed to be. But here you have these little concentric circles telling your thumbs how far they are from the center. But the whole design just seems to flaunt some really inconvenient button placement. Since the four face buttons are in the way of those pads, you're not going to be able to operate the movement pad while using the two buttons on the left. They claim that this thing will make PC genres like RTS games or Sims playable out in the living room, but even their example for a simpler config like Portal 2 doesn't seem to know where to put the jump button. I guess the cryptic little SP is our clue there, but if you click the movement stick to jump, then how do you do running jumps? But you know, what's more important for computers is that they help people do their jobs. We all need productivity software in our lives. I need to be able to write papers, work on websites, capture footage, record audio, just, you know, whatever to make videos. And oh yeah, what great videos those are, but just how easily can I expect to do work on an OS specifically built for play? Am I just supposed to only dual boot with this thing? I'd rather not, and I know that there are a lot of people out there who love Linux, but from my experience with it, it was a pretty unfriendly work environment. I guess I could just never wrap my head around how you execute programs without an executable file. SteamOS is going to be completely free for both consumers and producers, so if you had any worries about it being a locked up DRM riddled app store of its own, then there you go.
I guess the most confusing thing about it is that it's not really meant to replace anything. The Steam machines are for people in 2014 who are building new living room computers from scratch and want to save about $100 on operating system costs. And that is kind of a limited market. A Steam machine can't replace a Windows machine because it relies on it for legacy support, and Valve relies on it to do their business. But it's weird because so many aspects of this project are all about shaking up the status quo, but it's not really aggressively competing with the status quo. And this is one topic where I'm actually pretty satisfied with the status quo. Windows 7 has been a fine operating system for me so far, but over the next few iterations of Windows it might not be. And this is one hell of a way for Valve to prepare for that uncertain future. Prepare for unforeseen consequences.